not trying to make a habit of these like bummer overly transparent videos but what's a girl to do every year some new machines hit our eyeballs but is it actually worth upgrading the old ones and keeping them around well today we're gonna mess with that very idea I have the Cheaty Plus 4 here with me, and I've got a brand spanking new Cheaty box. Along with those two items, Cheaty sent over some stuff that's supposed to make these things all work together. So let's see how well that actually works anyway. Is that subtle foreshadowing? Guess you'll have to find out. This video is sponsored by QB, and I'll explain more about that as the video goes on. But I want to print a handful of models on this machine to get a baseline after a year of using it and not really maintaining it very well. Then finally, I'm going to upgrade it using the Cheaty Box and the associated accessories a little bit later in the video. Hopefully we can have a look together to see if it's really worth upgrading our old machines. Could you simply be better off buying new stuff? I don't know. Right. Let's begin by moving this behemoth over to the center bench. I think I'm going to need access to both sides, so this will work a little bit better. And luckily, the Plus 4 has handles on top. Unluckily, my benches are too tall for that to be any meaningful help in this situation. But with my super strong man muscles, I was able to shuffle everything around and now we can begin. Before I open any boxes up, I'm gonna run some prints though. The printers become my dedicated machine for any flexible materials because it handles the floppy stuff so very well. As such, I've had this super cool Morflex filament from BQ hanging out here for a few weeks, just sitting out in the open, absorbing that delicious moisture. This filament's pretty cool because it starts out life as like a 90A durometer rating, but once the print's finished, it becomes even softer, like 85A or something like that. No need for a special setup or anything, just super floppy, plasticky goodness. Now, I don't really need to test this printer. It's been nothing but a tank for me. It always connects to the slicer every time. It's never jammed on me. I really like it. You like that? But there is one issue that's really persistent with this printer and... I speak about it quite a bit on this channel with this machine and with other machines. The manual filament loading. I know, it's super lazy, but I don't like loading filament. We've got machines that come out with boxes and feeder motors and all these things. This shouldn't be a thing we have to deal with anymore. I don't want to spend my time waiting for the tool head to heat up and manually feeding in filament. So while the difficult task of loading the spool was already done, I ran off some of these wannabe Nerf football things for some of the guys at work. They turned out as good as you would expect, considering I didn't tune the filament in at all, and I'm using a generic 95A TPU preset. Well, that's good enough for me. I also printed one out using this foaming TPU. That's a cheaty brand. It gets softer as you print it hotter. Again, no tuning, so it didn't turn out very well at all. But we have verified the printer is functioning. We've got a baseline. Let's run off something a little bit bigger before we begin running these upgrades. Now I'm making this video a little bit selfishly because I've been wanting to print something kind of big using the Morflex that BQ sent over for quite a while now. Conveniently, I found this model using the Hive community from QB. It's like a parts tray thing designed to keep everything in one place when you're getting into your projects and taking stuff apart, inevitably losing tiny fasteners, that kind of thing. And this is something that I can use, but I also thought it'd be kind of interesting to flip the script on this model a little bit. It's meant to look soft, but be printed out of hard plastic. So I want to print it out of soft plastic so the hard thing is actually soft even though it's meant to look soft but be printed hard, but it'll actually be soft. Does that make sense? Anyway, QB's Hive has a range of offerings from the Hive community where casual users can print stuff for commercial or personal use, like this hard soft parts tray thing that we're printing here. But there's also stuff like the Hive Plus plans that grant the user access to commercial rights to models from specific Hive-only design catalogs. Those are for users looking to sell these Hive exclusive models, and they've got limited seats, so that's super exclusive. There's stuff available for many users, even if you're like me and you want to waste your special filament printing a big parts tray. And I'll touch on that more because I'm not trying to go full-on, like, ad read YouTube spec on this segment but I am excited, so check the link below. Now with my parts tray thing downloaded, I can begin slicing it to see if I have enough filament left over on the spool to print it at the size that I want to. So a couple of quick things to note when we're talking about slicing this model, or really most of your flexible stuff, or maybe textured things. For starters, I wanted to make this comically big so I could use it no matter what I was taking apart. 
And it's convenient that I was using the plus four and not a smaller machine because the designer already made this kinda big. That's great, I'll make it even bigger. Next, I needed to apply the designer's slicing settings per their model's page. It calls for fuzzy skin, and I typically use the random seam setting whenever I'm doing fuzzy skin stuff. That's just an extra little tip for you. Also, I typically print three walls and no infill when I'm doing flexible stuff, because I'm trying to get that squish, you know? For this model, those bridges would be asking a lot based on the shape of this thing, so I provided an exceedingly generous 5% infill using Archimedean cords to help with the overhangs and the bridging just a little bit. I could make the top layers thicker and not do any infill, and that would help with the bridging artifacts that would no doubt be present from not having infill, but I felt like this was the way to go for this model. So otherwise, we're looking pretty good. The print's gonna take forever because the fuzzy skin has that effect, but I've got plenty of filament left over to give it a shot at least, so let's run it off and see how it goes. And here's how the bed turned out. It looks excellent and the stringing isn't really that bad. It was super difficult to remove this from the build plate since TPU sticks in the first layer is a huge solid oval, more or less, so. <laughs> Whoops. But after applying some isopropyl alcohol and some manly man strength for nearly 30 minutes, the thing came free without any damage to the model. It is pretty cool and the size is perfect for taking apart jam cheaty boxes or extruders. In related news, I got the cheaty Q2C a little bit ago and I jammed the cheaty box, so I have to take that apart. <laughs> Dang it, dude. <sighs> Not my day. So this parts holder is gonna go into immediate service. But you know what's really cool about this? If I wanted to sell this model as a cool flexible part tray thing, I totally can. I paid the 10 bucks a month for the Hive community for the commercial rights to sell this model. Well, I didn't pay. QB gave me access to commercial license to sell this model. Okay, I paid for a subscription for Paul because he likes printing models and selling stuff. So I kind of paid? I don't know. This sponsorship stuff gets so gray, I don't know anymore. You too can have access to the commercial rights to sell these QB models. They've got a range of things available, just check the link below, because again, I'm pretty excited about this. The Morflex worked super great, even though I refused to tune it at all before printing it off. And this is a great example of something from the Hive community that's like, not strictly functional, but it's not purely decorative either. Wait a second, you're not here to listen to me talk about this excellent sponsor that's come on board this video. You're here to watch 3D printing stuff. Hopefully they find the link in the description. Okay, how about some upgrades then? It's finally time to do this thing. You're no doubt commenting right now. You're halfway through the video, you haven't even begun doing the upgrades yet. This is clickbait. I bet you forget to remove bed screws when you set up printers sometimes and then you turn it on and it makes a terrible noise. I apologize. Let's waste no more time. I've been waiting for a free second to make this happen for several weeks now. For me, I've got quite the mishmash of parts because I was given this upgrade kit as a pre-release package when the Q2 came through. Additionally, Chidi sent me over this filament hub and portions of the upgrade kit along with it, so we should be covered between nearly two full kits. But if you find yourself getting a Chidi box, likely you're gonna be met with something like this. It comes with consumables like the purge wiper pads and stuff like that. Also, the filament hub and the associated power and data cables are gonna come along with this kit. But the coolest thing that comes in these kits now is this little top glass riser thing. I've seen the printable versions, but I think this is super cool to have the manufacturer send one from the start. I like that. So I'll throw this onto my Q2 combo since that's the machine that it fits on and we can continue on the plus four. So another major piece of this upgrade kit is something that addresses an issue that I've raised before and I was super worried about initially, the extruder. This kit has you upgrade the extruder, which is probably good for a lot of reasons, but the reason that I'm stoked about it is the fact that there's no longer this silly gap in the filament path. I identified this issue when I did the four and four with the Chidi Plus Four, because I was worried about how this would affect feeding of filament from the Chidi box. Luckily, there's no need to worry. Chidi listened and they iterated and now we have an upgraded version. I'm sure they listened to me and I'm the reason that they made this change. 
Surely nobody else reported this to them and they couldn't have possibly come to this conclusion internally on their own. It was probably all me. The extruder unit comes off after unplugging one plug and removing two screws. Once the wiring is removed from the cable management, the whole unit can be wiggled out of the way. With that, we can get a better look at the differences between the old one and the revised version. Both feature hardened extruder gears, which is to say everything that touches the filament is rated for abrasives. The actual gears themselves are plastic. Otherwise, that gap that used to be in the filament path has been closed off and we're set to reinstall. Two screws and one plug later, we're good to go. With the extruder sorted, the final piece of the puzzle to go along with the filament hub is this adapter deal here. This was another concern that I had. I didn't know how they were going to handle this. There aren't any of the accessory plugs on this machine like you'd find on all the multicolor printers now. That's where this conveniently placed USB port at the back of the machine comes into play. Honestly, when I was moving this printer around, I was reminded of the placement of this USB port. I thought to myself, that's an odd place to put a USB port on the back in the middle. I mean, you can't even reach it very easily. What's the point? Man, I'm so much smarter than cheaty engineers because I wouldn't have put that there. Well, now I retract that statement because I see that this is an excellent place for that USB port. So we take the two screws out of the USB and plug in the adapter by kind of holding it from the inside because it falls into the machine. Then two new screws go in to hold everything together. From there, it's a simple matter of plugging in the data cables to connect the hub, the adapter, and the cheaty box all together. We finish the install by throwing the PTFE tubes into the box and the hub. Now once everything's powered on, we're going to need to initiate a firmware update. And after that takes place, the cheaty box is recognized and we can begin doing multicolor things. Just like that, our previous generation machine is multicolor capable. This is an incredible feature that I wish more manufacturers would implement. Luckily, there's a handful that do already, and I'm here for it. Also, there's no clever transition happening here. I just want you to know that for $2 a month, you can support the content being made on this channel over on our Patreon by subscribing. I said subscribing weird, but I'm not going to edit it out. Anyway, it's only 2 bucks a month because we're trying to do this full time, but we're not trying to take all your money doing it. Also, keoprints.com has some cool hats, shirts, hoodies. That's all. Let's get back to the 3D printing stuff. So now it's time to print. And though I could begin by printing another model from the Hive community, like this Flexi Dog, I'm gonna stick with the tried and true first. Even though you can use code KEO20 to get 20% off of your first plan. The plan's as low as $10 a month, those plans. Those are the plans I'm talking about. But yes, the tried and true nacho print, that's what we're gonna start with. I'm pretty stoked to see this machine with a multicolor unit on top of it, but how well is this really gonna work? Well, since the printer handles ABS and ASA so well, I thought I would load some up and try some of these newly available features. The cheaty box will dry your filament. It'll do it while printing too, which is a feature that we have to point out now thanks to bamboo. These spools of filament have been sitting out for a while, so I'm gonna start a dry cycle. But if you know how I roll on YouTube land here, I don't really make it that easy on these machines. I'm not a fan of printing under the most ideal circumstances every time, just so you can see how great the thing prints. I get these machines for free, and you clicking my link buying them gets me a commission, so if I can inject some realism into my videos, I really try to. So that said, I'm not going to fully dry this filament just because it's going to make the print work better. I'm just going to start the dry cycle, start the print, and know that the print's probably going to finish that way, but it may look a little bit goofy. Also, these are cardboard spools, and the Cheaty Box is not technically compatible with cardboard spools. I run it pretty frequently using cardboard spools and don't have any issues, so whatever. But that's a huge bummer, and I wanted to highlight it so you're aware of that fact if you're looking at making a purchasing decision about these machines based on my videos. Don't let YouTubers that get free printers bias your purchasing decisions. Anyway, this is my test print. If it goes well, I'll be trying a plate full of nachos to see if the thing has what it takes. And I'm certainly hoping that it has what it takes. Well, that wasn't meant to be. This is the point that I would run off my first print look at it, move over to a plate full of tiny nachos to see how it handles that, and then I could begin printing on the machine regularly. But that's not what's happening in this video now. You see, when I began the print, I kept getting error messages. First it would say that the filament ran out, 
Then there were times that the print would just run and stop. Finally, after babysitting the machine and trying to get the box to feed filament into the extruder, it would feed for a bit before stalling out and giving an error, even before the filament reached the inside of the machine. I tried it with different colors to see if something was simply wrong with one bay on the Cheaty box. Perhaps the spool itself was an issue, so we moved on to other spools. No luck, the filament just wouldn't feed properly. Now this is coming off the tail end of me testing the Cheaty Q2C and having that Cheaty box jam up and cause me issues as well. Like I've only gotten a couple of successful prints off that machine. So it's beginning to put a bad taste in my mouth for the Cheaty box, unfortunately. But many of you have reported inconsistencies and unreliability with the Cheaty box. Though I previously only used my original one with the Q2 and I haven't experienced any of those issues. Well, you know what? Now, twice in a row, I kind of see what you're saying. And it's a total bummer. You don't like that. I've got the Cheaty Max 4, what's it called? Cheaty Max 4 combo. I've got the Cheaty Max 4 combo sitting out in a box in my entryway right now, and I'm really excited to dig into it, but this kind of sucks, man. I hope I don't see those issues on that machine, but stay tuned because I'll be letting you know. For now, I'm going to talk with Cheaty support and see what I need to do to fix these machines. So let me know if you'd like to see a video on that process, or if you'd just like a simple recap to let you know how it went. Suffice to say, sometimes in the wide world of YouTube, things don't really go as planned. But I feel like it's exceptionally important to post these videos with the failures and shine light on the shortcomings of some machine systems, just as much as those successful videos. Especially if you're making a purchasing decision based on one of my videos. I still love Cheaty printers, I still think they're excellent machines based on my experiences with them, but I am beginning to wonder about the reliability of the Cheaty box. In the meantime, check out the Hive community from QB. I'm very excited to partner with them, so use code KEO20 when you're getting into one of your subscriptions there, because that lets them know you're excited just like me. Thanks to QB for sponsoring this video. Thanks to Cheaty for the free machines, even if the Cheaty box didn't quite work this time. Bye.